This is not how my hunts normally begin. But then again, this isn't a normal hunt. I'm going someplace completely isolated. Someplace few people will ever get to visit. But I didn't get special permission or pay a fee to be there. Because it already belongs to me. It belongs to all of us. And where I'm gonna drop you guys you see that saddle, not over this bald point, but the next one in that saddle, kind of the gun yep. sight saddle up there. That's where we're going. Okay. okay. In the United States, the federal government owns around 640 million acres of land, about 28%. More than 500 million people visit these public lands each year. It's the birthright of all Americans unparalleled in its richness and diversity, in an increasingly crowded world where open space is rapidly becoming one of the rarest and most valuable assets. America is unique in a lot of ways. One way that maybe we take for granted is the un unique value of being an American and having all of this public land and all this public access available to us. There's not many places in the world that have this much access. The quality of the lands, the, the landscapes, their productivity, their abundance of species, and the fact that we can go and enjoy them for nothing more than the energy to go on a hike. I would say that one of the greatest ideas that we've given the world and shown by example is the value of having a citizenry vested in these lands so that with these lands and our connection to these public lands we have this amazing conservation ethic that is it, it, it infiltrates every part of our being and every part of our way of life as Americans and what we stand for and what we believe in. But not all public land is available to the populace. In the United States there are massive amounts of public land completely surrounded by private land, making the enclosed public land private by default. It's landlocked. All right, Base, I'll take your headset. Today, I'm hunting in one of those landlocked sections. I'm on an island of public land surrounded completely by private property. And dropping from the sky is the only way for me to legally access it without trespassing. It's a little impractical, to say the least. It becomes really real when you see that helicopter fly away and go over the ridge. I mean, you're here. What you packed, what you prepared for, is what you got. We can't hunt today because we flew today. So today is going to be just kind of prep day. I can smell them. The reality is when you're here, there's no way out without trespassing. I've dreamt about coming to this spot for a long time. I hunt on a fair amount of private land, so I'm not opposed to asking for permission. In fact, I really enjoy meeting landowners and am generally well received. But to hunt here, it simply wasn't practical to ask permission. Did you stay in the pines where the sun never shines and shiver? In this particular instance, it wasn't just about obtaining permission from one landowner. I would have had to obtain permission from about three different landowners to get to this particular piece. And 
I know that can be challenging and it was easier to just, you know, use this helicopter trip as a chance to access this piece I had looked at my whole life and, and see if it was what I thought it would be when I got in there. You know, I think when somebody sees a helicopter flying over, they just automatically assume that that person riding in it has millions of dollars in the bank. And it's just not true. When you look at the costs of hunting and fuel and camps and just being away from work, you know, if you have one or two buddies that want to break up the cost of the trip, it's a lot more affordable than people think, for sure. We've always known about landlocked public lands, but we never knew just how bad it was until recently. Starting in 2018, the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership teamed up with Onyx Maps to determine the scope of the problem. I'm Lisa Nichols, I'm the Access Advocacy Manager at Onyx, and Onyx is a digital mapping company uh, we've been making GPS-based maps for hunters and other people that like to travel in the backcountry for over 10 years. So hunters have been aware of inaccessible public lands for a long time. They spend a lot of time hunting and scouring over maps and they recognize places on the map where they can't get to. My name is Joel Webster. I am the Vice President of Western Conservation at the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. Uh, we work to make sure that public lands are managed to support fish and wildlife habitat and fish and wildlife populations, but also access to public lands and making sure folks, you know, got quality places to hunt and fish. You know, when, when handheld, you know, GPSs came out with SD cards from Onyx, made the public aware of these lands that they can't get to. When you're driving along on the road and you look across the field, that's a private, you know, piece of land. But beyond that, you might have a state section. And you're like, how do I get to this piece of land? And you realize you can't get there. And that, it's really this, this technology that made the public aware of this issue. And so from there, it really kind of took off. You know, people started talking about this around campfires in chat rooms, you know, on social media, but also in the halls of Congress and at state legislatures. I mean, people started talking about this issue is knowing that it, it was there, but not really knowing to what extent. There were a lot of people at that point in time who were becoming increasingly vocal and upset of um, the amount of public land that they couldn't reach. And so we wanted to put numbers behind it to, you know, show the extent of the problem to the public and to the public land management agencies themselves. TRCP and Onyx teamed up and we decided that we were gonna do a project back in 2018 to identify and calculate the total acreage of landlocked federally managed lands in the West. And so the federal lands would be like the Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service, Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, plus other ones like Bureau of Reclamation. So far, they have discovered 16.43 million acres across 22 states. That's a little larger than the state of West Virginia and the equivalent of about seven Yellowstone National Parks. Seven Yellowstone Parks. That is an immense amount of land. And you think about how much value there would be if we could get access to that land, if the public could access that land. But what it tells us is how much work is ahead of us. In every acre that we work towards securing access on is gonna be worth every bit of the effort to do so. So the thing that was the most surprising to me was just the sheer quantity of inaccessible lands. I was not expecting that there would be individual states um, that would push over the million acre mark by themselves. And so we had multiple states, Montana, Wyoming, Nevada, that all had over a million acres of landlocked public land. Nearly all of the federal lands that are landlocked are, are BLM managed. And it makes sense though, if you start to look at the history of how those public lands were created, what the, the sort of history was that, that led to their establishment. There's a reason why landlocked public land exists. 
It dates back nearly 150 years to the checkerboard system of distribution used by the government to encourage westward expansion. Checkerboard lands, uh, it's kind of an interesting history. They came about from when this country was settled in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and the government, the federal government, Congress, wanted railroads to build their, their lines across the country. And to incentivize that, they uh, gave quite a bit of land to the railroads. The railroads could sell it to fund their uh, building of the railroad, but oftentimes they kept it. Those, the railroads kept those lands and they kind of evolved through, through the years to being owned by timber companies. Um, and so if you look at those lands on a map, there's, there's one section that's a, a still public, then the next section to the corner is railroad lands. And so it looks like a, a checkerboard that you would play checkers on. The checkerboard pattern or the, you know, the, the sort of township you know, and section sort of gridded system, it serves its purpose in terms of surveying the land and in distributing the land you know, in, with westward settlement. However, it, it just did not take into account public access because that was just not an issue of that day. And it's a legacy that's remained. Um, but it was just an unintended consequence and it creates problems. It also creates management challenges where even the federal agencies can't get to their own lands, which they're tasked by Congress and the American people to manage. And when they can't get to their own lands um, and then something goes wrong and they get blamed for it, I mean, that's a problem too. The problem comes in the form of access. Obviously, if a piece of federal property is completely surrounded by private property, it's inaccessible by land without permission. But the issue is further compounded by another obstacle, one that's commonly referred to as corner hopping or corner crossing. Imagine a, a checkerboard and the black squares are BLM land, the red squares are a private ranch. When, corner crossing is the idea where you walk up to that corner on that black square and you step over to the other black square. So you're basically stepping from one you know, square of public land onto another square of land. And it's a pretty heated issue in the West. You have you know, private property interests that argue that, that the private landowner controls the airspace over their land. And so therefore, by stepping over their land from one square of public to another square of public, you are actually trespassing over that private land. That's the general argument that's used um, by property rights advocates to um, sort of defend their position about uh, corner crossing being illegal. The sort of other side, on the flip side, they'll argue that they're not trespassing, they're just hopping from, from one square to the other. And really, is kind of interesting. This is really a, a pretty much a legal gray area in that there's legal arguments um, for and against it, but it's never really been settled. And so what you'll see is state agencies saying that they don't recommend it or it's not considered a legal option, um, not, not saying that it's illegal. Um, and, and oftentimes they'll be resistant to, to cite somebody for this unless, unless a landowner is really pushing for it. I've hired attorneys to advise me on it because it seems like such an easy process of, well, let's just step over these corners, what we call corner crossing. It may or may not be criminal trespass in that state. Each state gets to decide their statutes on criminal trespass. But under the United States Constitution, the Fifth Amendment, and all of the cases stemming from that that define what property rights a landowner has, every attorney has told me that this does represent civil trespass. So as someone who believes strongly in our Constitution, someone who believes that property rights are absolutely paramount to the society, the economy, the way of life that we've built, I can't bring myself to do it. I just, I have that much respect for private property rights. If we're willing to take shortcuts, and maybe a shortcut does violate someone's property rights under the Fifth Amendment, we've probably done more, more damage to our cause than we have to the benefit of what we're trying to do. And I know it's a long game, and I know it's frustrating, but we have to do it, and we have to do it right, because we hold out that we, we the public, we respect private property rights and we want our public property rights to be 
respected. You can't have one without the other. I knew the forest was going to be crowded this year. For good or bad, the pandemic has had a dramatic effect on recreational behaviors across the United States. Outdoor equipment sales have seen explosive growth as more and more people gravitate to wilderness areas. Knowing that the pressure on public lands is that much greater, it's nice to find this little private retreat. The pandemic has exasperated the problem, and while it remains to be seen if these trends will continue, in general, this is an issue that's not going to get better with time. Population growth will continue to pressure our available resources. Taking the first census, the 1791, was a relatively simple job. There were less than four million Americans, only one schedule to fill out with a few questions about color, sex, and age. Today, in 1940, the census enumeration is more complex than ever. There are more than 130 million Americans, millions of square miles to cover, and many new social and economic problems to be measured by census facts. In the middle of the 1800s, um, as the country was expanding west, the population of the U.S. was about 23 million, or roughly 7% of what the U.S. population is today. Estimate for the population right now, I believe, is 330 million in the U.S. Um, and by 2030, it's expected to be up to 350 million. Um, so that's quite a big jump, 19 to 20 million people. And by um, 2050, there's estimated to be about 400 million people in this country. And so you just think about um, the fact that they're just getting to be more and more people and, and more and more folks that you know, want to recreate, they want to use their, their public lands. And making the lands that we already own but can't get to accessible is a way to uh, provide additional recreation opportunities, but also helps disperse the crowds and, and spreads people out. And so maybe the impacts aren't as great in any one place. Every person, everywhere, must be listed, and every home must be covered. The nation's housing supply must be described. For millions of farms, acres must be recorded, livestock counted, crops listed. In the early development of America, the census took a vital part, for it was the basis on which popular democratic elections were first held. The pressure of population growth is not isolated to public lands. Private landowners are also dealing with an exponential increase in requests to access their property. Well, I'm a fifth generation for myself on the ranch. My family got here in the late 1860s and uh, we run a cow-calf operation at the north end of the Bridger Mountains and that's all, we, that's all I've done my entire life. So I've been there, I'm, 59 years old now, and that's all I've ever done. Right. Biggest change I've seen is just in the massive numbers of people that have moved into this area. You know, where you had a few people wanting to access your land or, or drive through your land or hunt on your land now it's exponentially grown. Whereas in the honey, in the fall, there's some days I'll get 80 to 90 calls a day asking for permission to hunt or recreate in some way or another. Like many ranches, Craig and his family have turned to outfitting to better control the animals and supplement their ranching income. Although they still allow public access to their property. And now we do one week of archery, and then we do the four weeks of 
rifle, bring hunters in, and after that, then it, then it's then it's when the public starts coming in. I think we allow a good over the years they've killed. I don't keep count, but they normally kill about 100 cow elk a year. So over the past 30 years, they've killed a lot of elk in there. But uh, the outfitting thing, I guess it's, you're seeing a lot of the ranches go towards it just because of the, the pressure that is from the public where it used to be, they just throw them wide open. And financially, I mean, the, the, the cattle market has not been great. The cost of production, has done nothing but skyrocket, and it helps. I mean, it it, it kind of makes up for what you that elk take from you. Not because when you raise cattle, all you do is raise grass, and you're using cattle as a way to turn into cash. Well, the more good, better job you do raising grass, the more elk you're going to have. So a little compensation for for providing for them doesn't hurt anybody. Land access can be an emotionally charged topic. As humans, I think we naturally try to simplify issues into right or wrong, black and white. It's easier than seeing all the gradients of color that make up any particular scenario. At a glance, it might be easy to frame this issue as sportsman versus landowner, but it's this type of rhetoric that only serves to drive us further apart. I think sometimes people try and make it that, but I don't think it needs to be that. I think that uh, showing respect for each other on both sides, because I mean, you, you do have some, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a very big advocate of private property rights, as I know you are, but you have some people that will try to block off a traditional public access. Like I say, there's the bad sportsmen that trespass and shoot cows and, and do bad things. There's bad landowners, but I would say 99% of the landowners, at least that I've ever come into contact with, they are allies of the sportsmen. They allow access in a lot of situations. I've donated elk hunts to the cancer center. I've donated elk hunts to MSU for, for both. Uh, wounded warriors come out, uh, Big Sky Bravery comes out, and they've we've used our, uh, our resources for the good to, to help the general public. The landowner and the sportsman have so much in common with this. The wildlife cares not whether it's on public land or private land. We want to see wildlife prosper on all lands. We want to see conservation on both public and private lands. We can solve this, but we won't solve it by banging on each other. We won't solve it by fighting and arguing. Sooner or later, the mature voices have to come forward and say, where are the solutions? Solutions exist if we look for them. Conflict exists if we look for it. And we gotta start looking for more solutions and less conflict, because there are landowners who are asking the same questions that we as hunters are asking. And those solutions are out there. They may not happen overnight, and they may take a lot of work, but they will happen. As Americans, we need to make sure the ranchers and farmers who have provided food for the people and animals of our great nation have a value in society that's worth far more than selling what they've worked so hard to protect. Nobody knows the care these lands need to thrive like the people who have lived and worked it for generations. If we drive them out anymore, it's a problem we can't come back from. I wanted to do this film for a couple of different reasons. One was I wanted to figure out how sportsmen and private landowners could work better together to help everyone involved. How can we create access yet make their lives easier? Um, less stress on their cattle, less um, wear and tear on their fence lines. The other reason I wanted to do this film was to kind of remind us of our responsibilities as sportsmen as we move forward. 
I've had a lot of conversations with landowners and hunters are our own worst enemy right now. Landowners who traditionally for years who have allowed access onto their land, thousands of prime acres of hunting ground that has elk, mule deer, whitetail, turkeys, um, you name it. And they're now cutting off access because they've been fed up with the lack of respect given to them by sportsmen. I hope that this film just reminds us of our responsibilities as sportsmen if we expect landowners to welcome us onto their property. And I have no doubt that the future of hunting and getting more people involved is all wrapped around access. Without access, we got nowhere to go. I heard one elk bugle right when I woke up this morning, straight east to camp. So we're just gonna have some coffee here quick, a little bit of breakfast, and then we're gonna hike up on the ridge here and see if we can spot and listen down, maybe catch a bull bringing his cows back up this way. The issue of land on public lands is not going to be solved with um, a single solution. Uh, we need sort of a multi-pronged approach and we do need a lot of organizations and agencies and local communities all working together. You can't buy your way out of this problem in all places, but there are places where it does make sense. We've got a bunch of public land, you've got like a ranch interspersed with it or some other private holding. and. And it's really in the public's interest, you know, to acquire all of it because it's just got awesome fish and wildlife habitat or awesome hunting and fishing or recreation values or something there of really high value that it's in the public interest to acquire it. The Elk Foundation has done a lot of work in some of these checkerboarded areas to go in and acquire the privately owned pieces. And so what we try to do is go in there and, and if the landowner is interested in selling, then buy that land and get it into forest service ownership. So to dissolve the checkerboard. You know, I think our cumulative number is over 1.3 million acres that we've opened up uh, and improved access on um, over our history of about 30, 30 years or so. Um, what, we're, what we're trying to do now with it is um, uh, focus on some of these small parcels and and then look to see if we can uh, talk to a landowner, see if there's any interest on a land from a landowner in selling, and then and then go forward in that way. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of landowners out there looking to do the right thing. Um, some of these, even these larger acquisitions that we do, the landowner is the one that decided, hey, I think this should be in public ownership. I think the public should have access access to this land. There are some. Forest Service sections, federal sections, that could potentially be landlocked, but we have made an agreement, we have a trails agreement that we worked on for years with the Forest Service to give the public access through a section that we own for that, and that where we checkerboard like that, we don't try and keep people off them. I mean, I think first and foremost, you know, in 2020, uh, Congress passed the Great American Outdoors Act, which fully funded the Land and Water Conservation Fund at $900 million every year. This is the most powerful tool available for um, expanding and opening access to public lands. Also, we'd like to see funding through the Modernizing Access to Public Land Act, the Map Land Act, that would direct resources to the federal agencies to digitize their easements in as short of time frame as possible and make that available to the public. So the public knows where they already have access rights to public lands where they may not even know it yet. That's at the federal level. At the state level, um, you know, it's really cool to see in places like Montana and most recently in Wyoming where the states have actually created, they passed laws in the legislature and created programs that are directly designed to address this issue. Montana has the Montana Public Access to Lands Act and in the state of Wyoming they just um, created a small fee increase on their, their conservation license, which then goes in for the state um, game and fish department to acquire easements to landlocked lands. You know, in, in terms of like what you can do, um, you know, get involved with a national organization that stays plugged in with this stuff at the national level that's tied into access. There's a few of them. TRCP is one of them. So is the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. 
second, you know, get involved with a state-based organization that you know, goes to the state legislature, and that's what they do, right? They walk the halls of those local capitals, and those people, hopefully, are focused on this issue. And uh, you know, I think otherwise, get out and enjoy these lands. And um, the reason we have public lands is because we've got you know a population of people that that love these lands and they use these lands, and we need to continue that. Only our second day of hunting called this just gnarly old mountain bull into our lap. Literally into our lap. This is not a typical hunt, but if anything, this experience has helped to further solidify, in my mind, the value of these landlocked lands. I would like to see everybody have an opportunity to go outside close to home. Um, I would like to see a lot more opportunities be made available um, for all forms of outdoor recreation, um, including hunting and fishing, and making sure that, you know, everybody has a has a opportunity to sort of get away uh, from the crowds, especially now, um, so that they can spend time outdoors. And I think get out and enjoy them in addition to advocating on, be on their behalf. Um, because you know that's why we have them is because we, we use them and we appreciate them and we're willing to defend them. Some people will ask why why bother with this? We have 600 million acres of land. Why why do we worry about the landlocked parcels? Because they aren't making any more of it. Because it's the land that you as a citizen you are a part owner in that land. And if we can get access to it, every bit of work we do towards that cause is beneficial to all of us. It vests us more in this process of conserving this great gift of public lands we've inherited. And I think if there's one thing about the generational passing on of this ethic, this conservation land ethic in America, is that we do all we can to improve public access 
for the next generation, and they will do the same for the next generation. So for us who are, who are vested in this process, who are working hard towards it, the companies, the nonprofit groups who are trying their best to get access to these landlocked parcels, every bit of that effort is worth it. And what I would like to do, I'd like to trade that half section we have that's landlocked for the half section where the existing trail goes through. And, and now that trail, instead of being an easement that's agreed upon by us and the Forest Service, can become public property and then say, I die and the place gets sold. Joe Blow can't go say, hey, I don't want anybody walking through my place, you know? So that would, that would create a permanent easement there and it alleviate the problem on the other side. It's a win-win. You don't have to love bow hunting elk or, or hunting whitetail during the rut to have an interest in what's going on here. This affects every American from West Coast to East Coast. This isn't just a private landowner sportsman subject. This is an everybody in the United States and the world subject. This is something that our quality of life depends on is protecting these. You know, if we don't have these wide open spaces, if animals don't have a place to go for sanctuary, the quality of life for humans, there's, there's just nothing left for us. What an incredible adventure. I'll get this thing spun up and get you home. Sounds great. Incredible.